boxes on. I never know if he is in the field really coming to turn. Good afternoon. This is the 4th of April, 1983, and we're very privileged to have with us Professor Ruth Bunzel, Professor Emeritus of Anthropology from Columbia University, and one of her former students, Professor Charles Wagley, who will soon be Professor Emeritus from the University of Florida. This afternoon we'll be discussing anthropology and its contemporaries and its history as seen by these two stellar professionals in our field. Professor Bunzel? Yes. You studied directly with Franz Boas. Yes. I, I came to him originally as a secretary. I had had one course with him when I was an undergraduate and was interested, but uh, you know, when I finished college, I was finished with schooling for a while, so I had a, it was a number of years before I came back. And uh, Boris looked at me when I came to be interviewed. He said, I know you. And I said, well, I had a course with you. As, undergraduate. He said, yes, and you always asked a lot of questions. So I kept on asking questions. I'm still asking questions. Did, uh, uh, I, I always read. I had one course with Franz Boas and, of course, knew him very, very formally. Yes. Formally, but all the, your group always called him Papa Franz. My question was, did you call him that to his face? Oh, yes, he loved it. From the girls. <laughs> From the girls? And he, uh, yes. He called girls by their first names, but not, but not the men. Did he always have the uh, uh, custom that to invite one graduate student for tea? Uh, I don't he did know in his later days. He used to. I, I know used one to. of the first things that, that when I was being interviewed, his wife was present at my, when I was, before I went to the job, and she said, can you make tea? And I said, oh, yes, I think so. She said, because I want to be sure that Professor Boas gets his tea every day. And that was a lovely custom because it gave time to relax and talk with the old man. And uh, sometimes other people were present, sometimes we were alone. But uh, it was a pleasant break in the day. Well, when he was older, he used to ask uh, Ruth Bryan, who was then his secretary, and you were already teaching, uh, to find one graduate student or invite one graduate student to have tea with him. And of course we were frightened to death. Because he would always he would ask you, and what are you doing now? <laughs> yes. And you had to think of something uh, si serious to say. And I made the mistake once of saying I'd read I was reading Grimm's fairy tales in German because I was trying to take my German examination. And I'd forgotten that he knew all about fairy tales. Yes. And I was completely at a loss. And surely had read them in the original. Oh, he had read them in the original and made uh, uh, erudite questions. And there I was, really, up against it. Well, when I went to, to work for Boas, I had followed uh, Esther Goldfriend. And she had been his secretary for some years, and, and, uh, and she left to study anthropology decided she didn't want to be a secretary anymore. And so the first question he asked me, he said, are you interested in anthropology? Or, 
or something funny, something about studying. Well, by that time, I didn't want to study anymore. I had had it. And so I said, no, I don't think he, he didn't ask me that. It was when, when I left after Esther, I left to study after to become a student. And the first question he asked my successor, Ruth Bryan, oh, and was, uh, was she interested in anthropology? He said, oh. <laughs> so. Uh, you didn't want to lose any more good no, secretaries. No, he said. He, I he found one because Ruth Bryan, if we remember, didn't like anthropology as a subject. She found the anthropologists very strange people. Yes. And except Boaz. And they were a funny pair because she was a New England lady of very dignified and, and very easily shocked. And that group of anthropologists that were around shocked her all the time. Yes. Uh, but she oh, was, she got used to them. Yeah. She got used to them. And she was in between Boaz and this uh, funny group. You went to Middle America to do your first field work. No, she went to Zuni. My first field work was in New Mexico. New Mexico. In, uh, in Pueblos. Zuni, and then I went on. I was in the Hopi Pueblos up in, the, in Arizona. Your doctoral dissertation was uh, Pueblo Pottery. Pueblo Pottery. Yeah. It's a beautiful book. Uh, when did you get interested in Middle American culture? Well, that was after, you know, after I'd been in the, in the Pueblos for a while, and uh, there was so much contact with northern Mexico that I thought I ought to find out, learn something about Mexico if I was going to go on working in the Pueblos. Well, I got interested in, well, I was going to go to Mexico. I. Uh, I applied for a Guggenheim Fellowship. I went down to see Mo, and he said, what do you want to go to Mexico for? Go to Guatemala. It's a much more interesting place. So I got a fellowship to go to Guatemala, and that's where I got it. Who was Mo? Mo was the secretary of the Guggenheim Foundation. Mm -hmm. Foundation. And he ran everything there, the fellowships. And the grants. How did, you, how did you find your way to Chichicastenango? Well, I went to Guatemala City first, and they said, well, if you're going to work with Indians, you ought to go over and go up to Chichicastenango and talk to Father Rosbach. He had been, he was a German priest who had gone down as a missionary, sort of a mission capacity and had been in Chichicastenango for a long time and was interested in Indians and in their language and, you know, was a man of substance. And so I went there and that's a magnificent Pueblo and beautiful, beautiful place up in the mountains and large 25,000 people and scattered around in the mountains and there, nobody had worked there. So I thought, nice, pleasant place to live, and so I thought, well, I might just as well stay here. So I stayed, and I lived in, uh, in the house, uh, in Father Rosbach's house, and had a very, very comfortable, <laughs> luxurious field trip. And it was very nice when I came home. Well, my, when my Catholic friends ever had a, a problem, they said they always came to me because I probably knew more than if I had been a cradle Catholic. And I learned. I said, well, I'm an anthropologist. I learned where I am. Well, the story of the bunnies going to Guatemala is really the story of how I got to Guatemala. Because... Uh, and she returned and uh, wrote the first draft of her book on Chichicastenango. She allowed me to read it. I was a grad, grad, first year graduate student. And so under her sort of direction, I began to read about Guatemala. And uh, her friends were my friends. I, uh, one 
friend she had made is Antonio Gobot, who uh, later studied in Chicago at Redfield, and who was a tourist guide in those days. And uh, then I met with him, Father Rustbeck, the same person. And that was a sort of a funny story, because uh, uh, we went to the church. I went with Antonio Gobot, and uh, Father Rustbeck was holding a mass. And we stood up in the back, and uh, he said in German to Gobot, I don't understand German, mixed in with his Maya and uh, uh, Spanish, get out of here and go to my house and have a drink and I'll join you briefly. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so that's the way I got what Guatemala is through yeah. in her story. His father Rusbach was very informal. He always talked to people during mass. <laughs> How many anthropologists was he responsible for uh, placing, ultimately? No. Several, I think. Uh, uh, through Bunny. Uh, well, Saul Tax made use of him. Uh, yes. Got to know him. Uh -huh. And Redfield visited Tax, and then uh, I think uh, Morris uh, uh, Siegel met him later. And Oliver Lafarge knew him. Yes. Well, everybody. Every. Every. American or European who came to Guatemala got to know Father Rosbach at one time or another. He was a great tourist attraction. Everybody went up to, well, Tichicastenango is a beautiful place with a magnificent market. So if you're visiting in Guatemala, you have to go there, you have to meet Father Rosbach. You were on the faculty at the time at Columbia University? Yes. I don't think so. Well, think. yes, because I was I, I took a course in Middle America with you. That before or after? Must have been before, I think. Uh, at least uh, you were had an office, because I remember reading your manuscript and discussing it. And uh, at least when I got back, you were, because you edited my dissertation. Yes, that I remember. <laughs> <laughs> you took a lot of editing, did you? I didn't did. Yeah, Modest, <laughs> modestly, she'll say no, but it was a lot of editing. It was know. a lot of editing, yes. Was he a good student? Sure. Aggressive? Was, aggressive. Yeah, aggressive yeah. student. Oh, I don't remember he was being aggressive. Well, I mean, I, you know, no. I, I wasn't that good, but I was always uh, asking questions and mm -hmm. bothering people. Sounds like a very common trait. Yeah. But well, I that's the way you get to be an anthropologist. That's, that's, that's the thing we do all the time, ask questions. You had a, um, I, in your book on Chichi Castanango, you have a, a one informant who was, a, his name is Tomas. Tomas Gonzalez. Tomas Gonzalez. Uh, he was the, as the key informant. I never met he, him. He was a he, key person in, in the... Village anyway. In what way? Oh, he was a, a leader, and he belonged to uh, important groups and confraterías and, and spoke very good Spanish, which is not the general language there. I mean, It was very difficult, I think, to find in the, this was in the late 30s, to find anybody, uh, or very few people who spoke mm -hmm. good Spanish. And uh, uh, I thought that people of Chichi Castellano were very difficult to, to uh, because they were very suspicious. Yes, well, they were very exposed and they had an awful lot of tourists coming through there, a magnificent market. And it was one of the things that visitors to Guatemala did was to go and see that market every Sunday. So they had hordes of outsiders coming through all the time. And uh, 
And Tomas was a very sophisticated Indian. He spoke very good Spanish. He was very at ease with it. Well, I think in those days, uh, uh, we were the poor relatives that, uh, in Guatemala because uh, the Carnegie Institute of Washington uh, had a program in archaeology and ethnology which really led to Redfield's Yucatan studies. And uh, Saltax and uh, some others were over in Guatemala. And they were luxuriously taken care of. Uh, but uh, I had $600. <laughs> A princely sum, no doubt. To yeah, well. Guatemala, and uh, it was $200 with the boat, back and forth in the boat. And believe it or not, I lived uh, seven months on $400. Yes. And, but I certainly wasn't as rich as the Carnegie Institute of Washington. People. Well, they had a they had, they had a big house in Guatemala City, and they had cars. They had cars. And most of them lived in, in comfort in Guatemala City, and sort of went out in cars to their villages. We you remember came out, We came out of the, the Boas tradition, where you go and you you live in your village. <laughs> off as much civilization as you can. Well, uh, they were mainly archaeologists uh, when I got there later. Yes. It was uh, Kidder, famous, who was doing his digs uh, right near Guatemala City, and Saul Tax, who was living on the lake, Lake Atilan. And... Uh, Is that when he was doing the penny capitalism That's study? when he was yes. doing Panhat Shell. And he yeah, spent several years there. Later. And he was somewhat later than Bunny. Uh, uh, then there were two or three other uh, archaeologists who were working in, uh, in down in the Patan. Uh, and Redfield was there when I got there. That's where I met Robert Redfield. And Lafarge was around then. Lafarge was up in my part of the Yeah. Had been there. Yes. When you went back later and studied Chamula in Chiapas. Yeah. Oh. That's a dismal place. Just tell them about, you should tell Dr. Bernard about Chamula. <laughs> what do you mean by dismal? Oh, well, in the first place, it's way up in the mountains, and it's cold and <laughs> rainy most of the time, and it's a miserable climate. and. Uh, they're difficult people, and it's unattractive. There's an unattractive village. It's spread out, and there's no vi no village center. There, there's a, a big field where they set up a market every Sunday, so on. That's about all there is to the center. And I stayed for a while with the school teacher dismal family, my girl and her mother, until I could get, and I had a very difficult time getting out into the village because nobody wanted to have me. Well, you know, it, uh, I remember, I visited Chamula later, but before I went, I read your article on alcoholism in Chamula. And uh, uh, how much do they drink per day? Oh, I don't remember how much, but they drink. Nothing can can happen without drinks first. If you go to ask a question of anybody, you have to exchange drinks and, and frequently in between and horrible stuff. And they all like to drink with me because I would accept, of course you had to accept the drink and, and touch it to your lips, but I, I wouldn't drink the stuff. So I would always hand it over to someone. So I was a very pleasant drinking companion because they never could get enough. I think in your article you estimated that an adult male drinks a liter of I don't remember of anymore. Into a day. It was well, I a lot. Yeah. They, nothing can, you, you can't ask a question or approach a person for anything, for any business transaction, without first drinking. Of course, I do know anthropologists who would think that was a paradise. 
No, but you can't oh, remember you to write. Don't know, just, you don't know what that stuff is like. You can't, you can't remember what to write down afterwards, either. Well. Now, since you had this idyllic situation in Chichicastenango, beautiful, comfortable, yeah. yes. what ever possessed? Were you doing penance by going to Chimola, or was there some other reason? Well, you go and you finish up with, uh, finish up what you plan to do, and you know, then you have to go to another place. That's, uh, How did you select Chamula? Uh, I well, sort of uh, fell into it. I went. I wanted to. Uh, you know, I wanted to go to one of these. Why speaking? Places in Mexico, so I went to where do I start out from? San Cristobal. Yeah. Los uh, Casas. Yeah. Los Casas. In Chapas. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Chamula is right next door to. to uh, it's right outside of there, uh -huh. about four or five miles. So. And it's right next door to Lodi's. Uh, sure. Yeah. Field station. Field station. Uh, but you'll notice that Vodi and his group didn't study Chamula very much. No. No. They studied uh, Sinacantan. 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 It's a much nicer town. Much nicer. <laughs> <laughs> or like well, Chichester Nango. I don't, I don't yeah, more remember like why I, how I got stuck in Chamula, but I sort of, I started off looking around when I came, and I sort of got stuck there. Of course, San Cristobal is a lovely place. Oh, yes. That's a, but that's... That wasn't for the kind of problem that I was working on. What were you working on? Oh, well, I wanted to get, I was looking for Indian backgrounds, and San Cristobal is a very mixed, beautiful city. I mean, beautiful location. The city itself is beautiful, but it's a lovely, high, tropical. Hmm. Tropical highlands in which there's nothing is pleasanter. How did you finance that trip? Oh, that was Guggenheim. That was still Guggenheim. I think that was the um, Well, turning back, uh, uh, did when did you you went when did you first go to the southwest? Uh, or not when, but who did did you go with Esther Goldfrank or? No, I went with Ruth Benedict. What for Ruth Benedict? Yeah, Esther. Esther came later. Later or earlier? Mm -hmm. I don't remember whether she was late. I think she. You went out with Ruth. Well, that's when Ruth studied. Uh, and she, she was with you in Zuni first. Uh, yes, and she was doing this great big focus on Zuni mythology, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I was well, I was a secretary. I had not had any anthropologist except that when I came to apply for a job as secretary, he looked at me, he said, I remember you <laughs> from his class at Barnard. And uh, so I was, a, I was a secretary for years then. And uh, Lois was going to Europe. He went every summer. And Ruth was going out to Zuni. And I had nothing to do all summer. And so I said, I, I might just as well go out to Zuni uh, and be Ruth's secretary. And he said, be busy. And he the last looked at me, he said, that is ridiculous. <laughs> go out, if you go to, go to Zuni, go and do your own problem. And I said, oh, I said I'm not an anthropologist. And he said, well, you're interested in art, aren't you? And I said, yes. And he said, well, do a problem of the relation of the art. They make pottery that have. Do a problem on the relation of the artist to her work, period. Of course, went off. Benedict was working in mythology. And I think he gave me a title of a book to read <laughs> somebody who had done some work on baskets in the Northwest Coast which was completely irrelevant. So, uh, how do I study the relation of an artist to her work? And I remember going down and spending weeks, 
well, it couldn't have been weeks because I didn't have that much time. It was but days and days up in the pottery collections at the Museum of Natural History and getting photographs of all the Zuni pottery and photographs of related areas and things that are trying. Oh, and I remember one of the things that I did was to take the pots and make paper mache uh, molds of them, which I then painted white and took down for the Indian artists to draw their designs on that I could take back with me without. So I went down to Zuni and I did a study of pottery. And then I, then I found I ought to have some comparative work, so I went around to other pueblos and got up to the, I even got up to the Hopi that summer. It was a busy summer. Well, you later then uh, went back to Zuni and, uh, and did, uh, uh, what do they call it, Zuni ritual poetry. That's a uh, very, very, well, big, big and important piece of work. I can't imagine. I learned how to learn the language, and uh, I took all the masses of texts of their, their, they have these long rituals that go on all night, and uh, so I, I had a very good in, informant who dictated his texts. They were. And he got to be. In the gossip of anthropology, this, or the uh, folklore of anthropology, I remember a story about you and your, this famous informant who gave, who dictated so many yes. uh, pages and pages of poetry, and that he felt that something had happened to him. Yes. Well, they have, of course, these rituals are, are very secret. And uh, he was an old man, and he, he was sick while I was there. And oh, this was a, a really chilling incident. So I went to see him while well, he was sick and part of things. He said, uh, I was collecting dreams at that time. And he said, I had a dream last night. You want me to tell you? I said, yes. And he said, I dreamt I was lying here in bed, as I am now. And you came, to, he said, no, what? He said, and a white girl came to the door. She said, it wasn't you. And he, I said to her, come over, my dear. And she came over, and she had a big bundle of prayer sticks, which produces the offering for the dead. And she handed me this, and uh, he said, then I knew I was going to die, because I have given away, I forget what the word was that he used, his, but anyway, his, he, in telling these rituals, he had given his soul away. And uh, he, he said, no, I know I'm going to die because I have given you everything with which I have to, which I have with which to protect myself. It was a chilling experience, and he did die within a few days. I don't think I ever quite recovered from that. That's a, that's a, mm. I'd be very interested uh, in knowing about your relation to the Zuni women potters. Well, the first that was a relatively harmless project that I went down in my first year. I went down with Ruth Benedict. She was doing a big collection of Zuni ritual, uh, Zuni myths, not the rituals. I did that much later, and. Uh, so I 
And so I remember going talking to Mr. Boas about this. Did I tell you this already? No, I didn't. No. And saying, well, I thought I'd go down, and I was a pretty good secretary. The knowledge is an awful lot of dictation. I said, I can take dictation, maybe be helpful, and it'll be a nice way to spend the summer. I had the summer off. He was going to Europe. And he said, ridiculous. That's absurd. Do a project of your own. And I said, Mr. Boas, I'm not an anthropologist. I'm just a secretary. And he said, well, you're interested in art, aren't you? I said, yes. Well, do a relation of the artist to her work. Did you contact Zuni potters? Yes. I mean, did you work with them? Yes, and I, I learned, make pottery, I learned did to you make, make pottery, pottery with them. Never very good pottery, but I learned, you know, the technique and what, what they were trying to do. And so uh, he gave me a book of, about Northwest Coast basketry, someone who had tried to do a study of, you know, artists and their and their work it wasn't very helpful. And I had to devise ways of studying. I remember going down to the Museum of Natural History where they have a big collection of Pueblo pottery and making paper mache casts of Zuni pots out of old newspapers and, and library paste. There weren't many. There weren't many anthropologists studying women. Uh, no, I don't. No, they had. Plus, the potters were women. The potters were women. I really wasn't studying women then until until that later when I started studying families. Uh -huh. uh, but I learned to make pottery, and then I went on and to other pueblos and learned different types of pottery. And, uh, Who were some of your students in those days? One of them. Yeah, I mean, A little later. There was Jane Richardson. Yes. Uh, Who else? Uh, well, Bernard Mishkin. Uh, well, very, very close to you. And uh, uh, Mars Siegel. Uh, I remember in classes with you. They didn't work, but Mars Siegel did work in Guatemala. Yeah. Jack Harris went off to Africa. Mm -hmm. Jane did her work in the uh, plains. But there was a, it was a small department. Uh, I think they're all told of... Small and poor. I, I go told we were about 18 graduate students, different ranks. And uh, the faculty in those days uh, would come to you and say, you know, it's about time you took your PhD examinations, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and so we will schedule you next month. That was it. It's a very informal department at that time. That changed get you out, huh? It's yeah. changed some. Yes, it is. Yes. There no, that didn't have six pages yeah, we of a a departmental policy which some departments have, uh, such as the University of Florida now. Well, there was this, we were on the top floor of the journalism building. We had a half a floor which we shared, I think, with the music department. And there was a suite of three little offices. Boaz had one, and the secretary had another, and then there was a third office where he, oh, he was doing a lot of, this was the, post-war period when he was very much involved in reconstruction, intellectual reconstruction. And that part of his work at the third office, and across the room, the hall, there was a big room, which was the seminar room. And uh, Melville well, Herskowitz had a desk in one corner, <laughs> and Ruth Benedict had a desk in another corner, and standing out in the middle of the room was the skeleton 
Probably the same film. Oh, Sam. My friend Sam. I don't think anybody ever used him in a class, not even that a kid. No, I used to use him. Yes, he was. Yes, he was. I just would make the skull off and take it to introductory anthropology. Mm -hmm. I had Sam wired. Yes. Uh, when I became chairman, one thing I wanted to do was clean up that damn gorilla skeleton. I found a man yeah. who makes his living going from university to university wiring up skeletons. <laughs> And he wired him up and cleaned him up so that it, after 30 years, it was a little bit better. Yeah. Well, here's our one piece of equipment, I think. I, remember, <laughs> I don't well, think we had know, anything I else except a, a few typewriters. There was a few typewriters, and I think there was an old-fashioned uh, slide machine with these 4 by 4 glass slides because Later, when the department was moved, they found thousands of these things, you know, uh, La Chapelle Man and the Cro-Mangan, and uh, nobody had opened them for years. And, of course, they were full of Northwest Coast drawings and things. That was this, about the, the equipment that did have. Yeah. Boys never got along with the president of Columbia University. So he didn't have a lot of equipment. He didn't have a lot of no. equipment. <laughs> he had Nicholas Mer Miraculous uh, Butler, who was the president, didn't see eye to eye on uh, world politics and racism and so forth. The boys was always at odds with him. Thus, uh, the magnificent equipment the Department of Anthropology had. Yeah. The old skeleton, the old same. And, uh, Yeah, no money well, Some of the students who were uh, earlier we than I was... We all to get our money out from outside. Well, it was Elsie Clues Parsons. Uh, yes. was a big help, wasn't she? Yes. It? In what way? Well, she was a very wealthy lady who was interested in anthropology. She had... Uh, well, she had been a, a great leader in women's rights and had been one of the first women to get a Ph.D. in social sciences. And uh, she supported a lot of anthropology. And she, of course, was, uh, uh, you know, became an anthropologist in the world. She was, right. she, was sure. she had a basket been in And uh, she did a, a work in Pueblos, mm -hmm. and she, don't forget her book on Mitla in Mexico. Yes. And, right. and, uh, and then later, again, a book on Ecuador was published after her death. But she uh, she was a funny person in my time, but very nice. She used to come, we always had Wednesday lunches. Yes, and graduate students sweet. and faculty would go and visitors from outside. And uh, we went to a little restaurant. We went to a little restaurant and Elsie yeah. would come with her Harvard green bag. And, and two a, fur coats. Two fur coats of which they were... Uh, one on top of the one other. One on the other, and they were moth-ridden, I mean. <laughs> moth-ridden, you see holes in it. No, she, cool. did, she didn't and believe she, in spending her money on clothes. No, she always come by taxi, and there was this very wealthy woman with two fur coats. Why, why two and no one ever... Because she asked. never could get to be warm enough. She was <laughs> always cold. She gave money to the AES, if I recall. That's right, and yes, she, she supported Mel Herskovitz's a uh, couple of his field his, mm -hmm. uh, uh, trips, and uh, uh, she always, well, matter of fact, there's, there's a story of how she, she and Boaz and this uh, famous Mexican, well, American woman who lived in Mexico, Nuttall, Oh, Zelia. Zelia. Yeah. How they decided to get together and train one Mexican anthropologist. And uh, Elsie uh, put up most of the money and brought Manuel Gambio to study with Boas. Hmm. Well, of course, he was responsible for the founding of an entire yes. intellectual yeah. Yeah. tradition there. And he went back and... Uh, formed really what uh, became Mexican anthropology today. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Elsie actually uh, uh, had my dissertation published. She paid for it. I didn't know it. She, Ruth Benedict, went to her and uh, sent it to them. Because in those days, you see, we couldn't get a PhD at Columbia uh, until your dissertation published. was published. And you delivered 75 copies to the Columbia Library. 75? 75. And uh, I think then you could get... I was buying with a big, expensive book with a lot of pictures. I got away with 25. With 25? I stole one from the library, one of the <laughs> copies you gave the library. <laughs> Oh, That's, yes, everybody. Well, I knew where they worked, because yeah, I worked in the library, yeah, well, and I filled stolen was, dissertations. That was the way students built up their, li their libraries, <laughs> stealing dissertations out of them. Out of the collection. Mm -hmm. Well, they probably didn't pay enough for the library. Well, I mean, it was, only, it was not until 1952 that they uh, followed other universities and did away with that old European. Mm -hmm. uh, a tradition in Columbia. And uh, you'll notice that a lot of people got, this, got their PhDs in 52 who defended in 1940 and 1938 and things like that. Oh, they waited. Well, they had to. You they couldn't, couldn't get it until, until, until you had your deposited the copies you had in the library. Copies 52 was the year that Stewart left Columbia. No. I recall. Was it really? Yeah. He went to the University of Illinois in 52. I thought it was a little bit later. It may be mm -hmm. that early. Okay. There weren't, uh, there weren't, there weren't many women hired on the faculty at Columbia. No. It seemed that there were a lot of women who worked yes. at Columbia. That's right. And who worked in and around and within the aegis of yeah. the department. But not actually hired. Well, did you tell oh, us something I about go that? Oh, I out and, and among his, he had a lot of rich friends. We get money from them for projects that he was interested in, and then hire students to work on them. That's the way most of us early ones got supported. You're, you're right. There were not many. Uh, women who were first, uh, Boaz, I don't know, didn't know Boaz as well, but as I understand it from my, learning from my teachers, Boaz had the European idea and that uh, there was one chair and the other were part of that, uh, like the Katerda in Latin America. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so it was very slow. He didn't have very many assistant associate professors around him, and no other full professors. And uh, well, that was that, I don't think that was his choice. You didn't think so? No, I think that was. But Butler didn't like Boas for mm. many reasons. So even among, Benedict. Among was, the reasons was that he was German. Yeah, it was very late that even Ruth Benedict was appointed. Uh, to a tenure faculty position. Mm -hmm. um, I think she was in her 50s yeah. before she even became an associate professor. And Mead? Well, Mead never... Mead uh, was never... Uh, no, she before. was an adjunct always, but because she wanted to be... She was in the museum. She was at the Yeah, I tried to Maine. hire Mead away from the museum, made her a sound author, and she said I wouldn't move, she couldn't move her office. You remember, uh, if you ever saw her office, she had three or four rooms well, she, stacked with books and she, clippings. And she had a very good deal at the museum. She she had this appointment, which she, you know, she did whatever she wanted. So she came and taught for us. And a lot of the, well, Jean Welfish was another who was always a lecturer and taught as much as a professor. Yeah. And Bunny taught for years. So. Yeah. With no appointment. With no formal, uh, formal appointment, but no tenure. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, Columbia was not good to women. Uh, no. Uh, but they had a lot of famous women around. Mm -hmm. 
In fact, it's the nest of anthropological. Mm -hmm. and they all came out of Barnard College. Well, an interesting thing was, uh, you see, uh, Boaz fought with the dean of Columbia College, which is the boy, uh, male section, mm -hmm. or something, the dean Hawks. So he wouldn't teach at Columbia College. If you wanted to hear Boaz as an undergraduate, you had to go to Barnard. And Barnard, for a long time, didn't ex wouldn't accept men to come even to their classes. That was even in the 30s. You so, couldn't, couldn't register. You could come as yeah. a visitor and sit in the coat closet or something like that. <laughs> well, come for so if you were an undergraduate and wanted to hear Boaz, you had to sort of be, go over to Barnard College uh, and uh, hide, hide and close. Uh, well, it wasn't, it wasn't, as, it wasn't as bad as... Uh, as Harvard, I remember Clara Dubois' stories. Of, she was at Radcliffe about trying to take courses at, at Harvard and having to sit in the coat closet because they couldn't have women around. They would distract the boys. Well, as, in later, when I was appointed instructor in Columbia College, there were no women in Columbia uh, teaching on the staff of Columbia College. And I wanted a year's leave of absence with my instructorship. And they decided they would appoint Marion Smith. And Columbia College went into almost a, a, a male strike over there. There's no women ever taught in Columbia College. And uh, I think Marion did teach. Yes. She went, was the first woman to teach in the undergraduate division. It was a revolution. Yeah. And Benedict was the first female to sit on the faculty of political science. So that, you know, it was, it was a male uh, old gentleman's faculty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What did you do after Chamula? After, let's see. Uh, Oh, you went to you went to work for the contemporary cultures. Well, that was yeah. uh -huh. that uh, the, 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 the study of cultures at a distance. Yes. Mm -hmm. The war project. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that because you did a study of China. John Wheatley, we, we were very, we were very restricted in what we, what we could do on that project. This was, uh, you know, out both of World War II. These were, were, were studies that were supposed to help with the general reconstruction of the world after World War II. And among the other things, we had a uh, group working on China. And I had three Chinese girls. I n never could get a Chinese man to stay with the project. He thought we were frivolous. We, and then they, and uh, they would be just, the man would come, work with us for a few weeks and leave. But we had faithful Chinese women. I headed that project. What was your relationship with uh, Ralph Linton? Mm -hmm. Well, I was I was part of the you know the Benedict period that that Ralph inherited and was not very happy with. And they were not very happy with him. It was not. The, his first two years were difficult for everybody. How so? Well, he. Well, a lot of people thought that, that Benedict should have had the, the major appointment there. She had been there for years, had carried the department mm -hmm. after Boris died and 
And she was passed over, probably because she was a woman, I guess. And, and they brought in Ralph Linton from the outside. And he came to, into a department that had been very loyal to Boas and Benedict, and he had a tough time. It was not, it was not easy for him or, or, or for the other people who were around. What kind of tough time? Well, the students tended to be hostile. And, And Boaz was still around. Uh -huh. Yes. Boaz kept his office. So. Oh, yes, and Lynn had an, an office down the, down down the, the hall. hall. And Boaz and Lynn, you know, you know the story of uh, Boaz story. and Lynn. It's an old story of when, uh, you know, Boaz was neutral during World War I and a pacifist. And uh, Lynn, what? to fight with the Rainbow Division in France. And as soon as the war was over, he came in his uniform to Columbia. He says, Professor Boaz, I've come back to study with you. Boaz looked up at his uniform and says, get out of my office. That was the end of that relationship. Mm -hmm. Lyndon went off to study with Har uh, Harvard. Yeah. And uh, then he came back and Boaz was still a great old man and kept his office. Oh, and here Linton came to the great old man. He had the department, department and he had a little office down at the end of the hall. And Boaz wouldn't give up. Boaz wouldn't give it up. So then the students, you know, were all. So Boaz kept the great big office. Big office. Yes. And Linton, the new with, chair. With, this, the, with the secretary. And even the, the secretary office. was loyal to Boaz. <laughs> And here Linton came to be chair of the chairman. He had a little of office and down, and he had to walk <laughs> down the famous. hall every time he wanted to dictate a letter to the secretary. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and Ruth Benedict had the other office on the other side of the the central, the secretary's office, uh, so that she was sort of on the inside. <laughs> Linton was on the outside, and uh, the students all treated him as an outsider. Couldn't have been easy for him. No, no it, that's it, was not easy. it was not easy for anybody. And he is not, uh, Linton was not an easy person. And he was jovial, mm -hmm. but he had a, a dose of paranoia, and you can yeah. see that the situation was not good for anyone with paranoia. No. Well, paranoia is when you think people are out to get you, but they're well, not. They might. Yes. Yes. <laughs> he may have had a dose of reality. He may have had a little bit of a dose, you know, so it wasn't very conducive. Sounds, sounds like they were up to him. Well, I don't think not so. Not quite. Not, 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 not really bad, after really. him, but uh, just loyal to the to the old guard, mm -hmm. Boaz. And, and Benedict was around. They both, Boaz was still using the big the big office, and then there was a little a little secretary's office in the middle. And Ruth Benedict was on the other side. She didn't give up her office. And well, Linton was down the end of the hall someplace, along with the people like me who had no status at all. <laughs> when did that change for him? Well, uh, the war well, broke out, and uh, uh, Benedict went down to Washington. But the department broke up. Everybody was away. Now, he got his way in many things. Uh, I owe my appointment in Columbia to Linton because there had never been an anthropologist at Columbia College. And uh, Linton was such a good lecturer that he uh, taught at Columbia College and built up a, yeah. a big Linton's. following among the Columbia College boys. And that's created an instructorship, which uh, I was fortunate enough to be offered. And uh, but then I only held it one year. The war uh, broke up and broke out, and then everybody moved away. And of course, Boaz died during the war, didn't he? Uh, just, yeah, yes. 44, I think. 44. Yeah. So when he got back, uh, 
uh, Linton was the big shot. Before then, he left and went to Yale uh, as a sterling professor. Mm -hmm. uh, and by that time, well, he, he was a, had made peace well, with everybody. So I have. To. Sort of, yes. <laughs> Uh, it was a truce. Well, Boas, a truce, uh, a distance. When Boas yeah. was retiring, you know, he wanted Ruth Benedict to have the get the job there as the head of the department. She had been there for years; had been teaching and trained students. And there's an old story about Linton. I don't know whether it wasn't at this time, but it must have been early. It was shortly after World War I. And Linton came to apply for a job. He came into Bowie's office in his uniform. He had just gotten out of the army. The boy threw him out. <laughs> he was very... But, he was a strong pacifist. Of course, the, just before the war, uh, uh, there was a small department, but we, there was a, a group all if, interested in the Spanish War. And Boaz uh, and, and Benedict had said we uh, keep our politics out of the department, but we had the mim mimeographing machine going. Yeah. 24 hours a day on pro pro loyalist mm -hmm. material. Were there people from the department actually involved in the Lincoln? I opened services uh, that later came back from the Lincoln Brigade. The Lincoln yeah. Brigade yes. and people in my class in college joined. Johnny Mura, who was not in Columbia at that time, but came through Columbia, mm -hmm. he fought in the Lincoln. Some of them didn't come back, of course. But there was a, a lot of well, there were, propaganda going on. We were always having parties and to raise money. When, uh, the after World was. War II, there was a, a laboratory, was Odeking's laboratory, mm -hmm. he was a physical anthropologist, too, uh, was torn out to redo it. And behind one of these cases, pushed out from the wall, I, uh, we found tuna fish, asparagus, uh, tons of canned goods that were collected for the Spanish loyalists in the 30s. And this was in 1945 or 46. Oh, I don't remember that. Oh, God. <laughs> we found all these canned goods that had fallen down the, behind. Mm. So it was an active uh, department. The, uh, well, Boaz wasn't exactly politically inactive. No. No, no, he wasn't. Yeah, no. Uh, he, he set quite a tone. Uh, yes. Judging just from his writings. Particularly just before World War II. Uh, and... Uh, well, he had this refugee committee that rescuing intellectuals out of if we're getting into difficulties in Germany. And we had them around. They were a great nuisance a lot of the time. Have you been they, reading the... They uh, expected the red carpet to be rolled out for them and to have everything provided. Mm -hmm. Have you been reading the stories on uh, about Derek Freeman's book and Margaret Mead? Well, yes, I read... Uh, Some of it. Bunny has been... We've been talking about yeah. it. I read the book. I had to... You had the book? Well, I got the book from Margaret Harris. I borrowed it and the galleys, mm -hmm. or page proofs. And I think it's a scurrilous book. I agree with Margaret Harris. He proves at many points. He's, it's a well documented, but uh, I think he's completely wrong with the Boesian tradition, and yeah. I think he's uh, uh, 
uh, doesn't prove his case about Margaret. And uh, I think he's opened up the old bag of uh, worms uh, of nature and nature. Mm. And we're just back. We thought that battle was over. Mm. How about you, Professor Pazel? What do you mean, Mark? What? Have you seen the materials? No. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I have to get it. You don't want I to don't buy want it. To buy it. Buy it no. I don't want to buy it. I want to find a copy someplace mm. that I can read without having to buy it. Sounds from the reaction it's of the field that uh, there's a potential example of how to publish and perish. Yes, I know. Uh, well, he's, he has a well, reputation of being a, def a difficult man. Well, I think we've had a wonderful discussion. Thank you very much. Appreciate you both being here today. Okay, Chuck. I remember, right. but I don't remember details about her, what she was doing. Okay. Well, there's another person we'd like to uh, ask about. That's uh, Zora Neale Hurston. Uh, Zora Neale Hurston was born in Florida. Uh, some years ago, uh, her brother sent us a modest check to help a black student to study anthropology. And uh, Saul Kimball, whom you knew very well, uh, decided that we would use this as our nest egg and try to raise further funds so we could have a, a good, solid fellowship for a black student to come here and study anthropology in Zora Neale Hurston's name. And uh, at this point, we have seventy, eighty thousand uh, dollars uh, in a fund which we hope will soon reach a hundred thousand and thus give a fellowship every year. Uh, so it was a great interest here in, mm -hmm. in Zora Neale Hurston. She was one of your colleagues in, yes. I, in Columbia and at Barnard College, I think. I don't remember whether she was at Barnard or not, but I certainly remember her at Columbia. So what happened to her? Well, she, uh, you know, she wrote these uh, well-known books uh, on Southern folklore. Yes, I knew that. And uh, became a novelist as well as an anthropologist. Uh, it's a very sad story, I understand, that uh, she uh, died and came back to Florida and died in really in poverty in Southern Florida. And uh, uh, there's been a renaissance. Uh, it, there's been a book written about her as a black writer of her time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think she was Gladys Riker's assistant at Barnard. It could be. I know she was around the Columbia department for several years. But... And uh, I met her once, uh, but she was, of course, uh, I was younger, and uh, I'd never done field work. And you know, if, they, if you haven't done field work, you don't. You have. don't exist. No. You don't exist <laughs> in, anthropology. in anthropology. So I hadn't done field work yet, and so I was not in the upper group. She was a friend of Bill Whitman's, and. Oh, yes. Did you know her at all? Yes, I, I knew her. I, I, well, what, what was she like? I didn't know her very well, you know. It was a, a, a personal relationship that was you know, very professional. I knew what she was doing, and that's about all. Uh, did you ever talk about why she went out of anthropology to, you know, the world of the novel, or why didn't she 
she studied in anthropology? Well, I can understand why people go out of anthropology <laughs> in those days, because you couldn't make a living at it. Well, then, uh, uh, we had many, uh, uh, we had other people who were doing other things. Uh, Ruth Benedict had two personalities. She was a poet, yes. a poet as well as an anthropologist. People like Carl Withers, who was a writer and wrote under mm -hmm. the name James West, and, and a very interesting fellow, William Whitman, who had written a couple of novels. So uh, it wasn't far from... Uh, you know, to be an anthropologist was to be something like a writer. Oliver Lafarge made his living from writing. Anthropology was his fun. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, sir. Oh, you got to click. Oh.